That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Scrapper, the directorial debut of Charlotte Regan, which premiered at the 2023 Sundance Film Festival, where it took home the grand jury prize in the World Cinema Dramatic section. Uh, it is being released courtesy of Kino Lorber on August 25th, 2023. The story, Georgie, a dreamy 12-year-old girl, lives happily alone in her London flat, filling it with magic. Suddenly, her estranged father turns up and forces her to confront reality. Uh, my pull quote, Scrapper is an effectively sweet, quirky, and sometimes immature look at grief and the importance of family. Mm -hmm. uh, mine is a touching, if somewhat familiar, tale of a familial chasm bridged through necessity fueled by trauma. Uh, an unfussy, naturalistic performance from newcomer Lola Campbell elevated, elevates it considerably. Mm. Uh, yeah, the story is pretty simple. So Georgie uh, is played by Lola Campbell. She's a 12 year old whose mother just died and the father is out of the picture. He hasn't been involved in any of her raising or upbringing. And she's living alone in this flat because she is telling social services her uncle is there and they believe her because she has uh, recordings of a man that she uses to talk to social services, which we can get into. But, um, yeah, and, and she's just running around th this neighborhood with her best friend, Ali, mm -hmm. played by... Uh, Alin Uzan, also uh, making his debut. And one day, this man pops up, Jason, played by... Harris Dickinson. And he says, I'm your dad. <laughs> so, of course, it's like, oh, because you found out the mom died, now you're here. And things aren't as awkward as one would imagine. Like, she's not being like, you're not my father, where were you? She's just kind of like, well, I'm fine on my own, and mm -hmm. you're kind of like throwing a wrench in my stuff. But... Yeah, she wants him to leave. Yeah, she doesn't want him there. Because she's making money stealing bikes. Mm -hmm. And then selling them to, like, this crooked bike shop owner who works out of a storage unit, which I think is funny. Mm -hmm. But Georgie and her dad bond because he's more immature than she is he, basically yeah he's showing her how to steal bikes properly <laughs> and almost get them caught and almost gets them caught and in the end um they do connect because we find out that the mom knew she was dying she had a terminal illness and she's tried to contact jason he's not responding so she leaves him a voice message and one day jason because now that their relationship, like Jason and Georgie, the mom, the dad and the daughter, it's the most strained. He ends up leaving, but he leaves her his phone and tells her, listen to this message. And the message is from the mom saying, I know you're not a part of her life and you're not returning my calls, but she's like an amazing, quirky young girl. You'd love her. And I think she needs you now that I'll be gone. And an important thing the mom says is, I told her that I'm going up to the sky. But I know she's not stupid enough to believe that. But she is, which we can get to. Um, so that's when Georgie realizes her dad is there for a reason. So they reconnect. But the thing about uh, going up to the sky is this movie has like moments where it feels like a documentary because people in the neighborhood who know Georgie are being interviewed. But also we get these fantastical moments. We get some flights of fancy that I think convey what's going on inside her head, yeah. Georgie's head. Which basically amounts to like a big tower going up to the sky. And then we realize that in Georgie's apartment, there's a room that she keeps locked. And Jason finally breaks into the room. And we see that this little girl's actually building a tower to go to the, like, to the roof. To, to the, and, and therefore the sky. Right. And it's not, and I don't think it means she's stupid. It's just that when you're a kid sure. that's been traumatized, sure. you want to believe there's some hope and chance you know, that you're going to reconnect with your, your mom. But in the end, her and her dad, like they give each other a big hug and we see them basically walk off into the sunset. Well, they kind of barter about, about, about he, he says, I don't think it feels like you don't need me. And she, he estimate it makes her say, yes, I do. I do need someone. I do need you. Yeah. Which I thought was really touching. The opening of the film is a quote and it says it takes a village to raise a child and then it gets crossed out and then in kids writing it says I can raise myself thanks. <laughs> uh, the best part of the movie is the girl. Oh yeah. Yes. She is so cute. 
and well, funny. Because it's not uh, like this forced precociousness that we usually see with children. She really just seems like she's a little girl on a mission to care for herself. It reminded me of if Mike Lee had directed The Little Girl Who Lives Down the Lane with Jodie Foster. Oh. <laughs> So we meet Georgie and her friend Ali. I thought he also did a very good job. And they seem to have a really sweet friendship. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're delinquents, right? They're stealing bikes. But they don't seem like bad kids. It's just like she's trying to figure out how to make money. <laughs> yeah, it's not for profit. It's for survival. So yeah. I don't know. That kind of changes. It changes a lot. And also, they're stealing... I mean, them stealing bikes, they're not very good at it. They're. I mean, they're good enough to get some bikes. <laughs> and then the woman they're dealing with she appears to be like in her early 20s mm -hmm. and she's kind of like well styled and like working out of a storage unit which you know is hot or cold it's not temperature controlled and then georgie and Ali going to her to try to like negotiate the fee for the bikes and clearly they don't know what they're doing it's all very charming mm -hmm. um okay so the social workers who are supposed to be checking on georgie they're being fooled because she's telling them that her uncle, Winston Churchill, <laughs> is taking care of her. And they believe her. And then there's this, like, guy working at the local convenience store. This, like, young guy. And she's been having him record, like, sentences, like, voice memos in her phone. Like, I'm doing great. We're having spaghetti for dinner. Mm -hmm. She's recorded all of these lines. So whenever social services calls, she just gets on her phone and on speakerphone plays his notes so that they can have a conversation, which I thought was funny because clearly social services, who are one of the people we're interviewed in the documentary, or we see interviewed, they clearly are like not fully, like they're kind of checked out from the process. Uh -huh. So this little system she has works. It's, it's giving me uh, Kevin McAllister, AKA Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. I mean, she's almost that cute to she, me. She's pretty cute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Part of the fantastical nature of the film is we get a couple of moments where there are spiders in the apartment mm -hmm. and the spiders have their own like, it Com almost looks like a comic book. A comic book strip, yeah, where they're... I like weirdness like that. Deliberating about what the humans are doing, yeah. Then there are two sets of kids who are being interviewed about Georgie. One of them is a group of girls who are kind of like, they're all dressed in pink and they're supposed to be like maybe the... The posh girls. The mean girls. And the mean girls. And then another one who I thought was super cute are these three young boys who are triplets. <laughs> uh, these three black boys. And they look so cool because they're wearing like yellow suits on yellow bikes. And the way they interact and talk I thought was really cute. Yes, because I think those elements could have felt very overdone. Yeah. And, and they don't. And they don't. So at a point, Ali and Georgia get into an argument. And they're like friendship splits. So at first, I'm like, how long have they not been talking? And like everyone's talking about it because Georgie's trying to make friends and no one wants to be her friend. <laughs> and then we realize that they've only not been talking for like 12 hours. <laughs> but it seems like a lifetime. When you're a kid, that seems like a long time. <laughs> I thought that was very well done. So then now that Jason's in the picture and he's kind of... It's clear Ali likes Jason because he's like a... You know, like a man, but he's still young. And it seems like Ali... Because we see his, we meet his mom twice, and it looks like maybe the, his dad's not around. Mm -hmm. So Ali seems to really appreciate this like ma adult male figure. <laughs> More so than Georgie. And we see Jason making them dinner. And apparently he burnt the garlic toast. So then one of Georgie's teeth falls out. <laughs> But there's a really sweet moment where he sneaks into her bedroom because there's a, a period where she's concerned like maybe he's like a creep and that's why he's there because she can't prove he's her dad. But he sneaks into her room and it looks like he's trying to reach under her pillow. And she's like, are you trying to steal my money? Because that's where she keeps her money. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, girl, I've tried to check for the tooth fairy. But she doesn't know what the tooth fairy is. I thought that was a really sweet moment. It, it's a cute scene as well. Okay, one of those mean girls in pink. Mm -hmm. She She's kind of bougie. And she's talking to Georgie, like following her. She's not being mean per se. That almost seemed like an olive branch. She's yeah. extending to her. But... Yeah, in her way, she's trying to like be nice to Georgie. Mm -hmm. And Georgie doesn't like what this girl's saying. And she whoops the hell out of her. <laughs> so then, of course, the girl's beat up, goes home. And then Jason goes to talk to the mom. 
Because he tells Georgie to like offer something and doesn't she give her like a cake? Like she just throws a cake at the front door. Yeah. But Jason goes to talk to the mom and the mom is like berating him. Like your daughter did this and what are you going to do about it? And the dad tries to hand her a wad of money. Like here, this should, this should cover it. I thought that was really good. It, it, but it also reminded me that we don't get a lot of details about what's going on with Jason or what, what he's doing. Because uh, there's some sinister elements about maybe how he's been living his life. Yeah. Um, I think the best scene in the film is the, uh, there's a moment when Georgie and Jason are starting to get along. And they're at like the train station. And they're like, oh, let's pretend we're the people. There, there, there's a couple, a man and a woman across the platform, like just standing there looking like the perfect couple. So Jason's like, let's pretend we're them. So Jason and Georgie are talking like this, like boyfriend, girlfriend. And I thought it was, she was super cute. Mm -hmm. uh, but my last note is, like you just said, I wish I would, the thing that's missing for me, I really did like this movie, but the mm -hmm. thing that's missing is I wish I knew that Jason were capable of taking care of her. We don't know anything about him. We don't know how he makes money. It would seem like you said that maybe he gets into some nefarious stuff, but he doesn't seem like a bad guy. I, I, I think because I like the little girl so much, I just want to know that she's going to be fine. Yeah. I don't trust Jason yet. Same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like he had, had makes questionable choices. Enough so that he can just have a... We don't see him working, and he just has a, 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 lot, a lot of money. money that he's willing to give away. And, and all this free time would just go chill. <laughs> yeah, so something is not quite right there, but it's interesting. Uh, it, it's, you had brought up a film we reviewed earlier this year card oh, called yeah. Moon Garden, and how the, about a girl in a coma, and we're kind of following her through this industrial landscape inside her mind, and how this feels kind of like an elevated version of that. And to me, this in that I do agree with that statement. It also feels like it's somewhere on a continuum that uh, is along the lines of uh, After Sun with Paul Mescal, which mm. came out last year. Um, also of note, it, this was shot by Molly Manning Walker. Uh, as a cinematographer, she her directorial debut made a big splash at Cannes this year called How to Have Sex. So she's, uh, of course, having a great year. But I, I liked how this movie looked. I, I did like how it looked as well. It, It's, you know, East London, and it, it, all, it almost doesn't quite feel like that because we're stuck in this one neighborhood neighborhood of these tenement, these strangely painted tenement houses. Uh, but yeah, I, I liked it. What would you give this film? Three. I would give it three and a half out of five. I thought it was very good. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.